Hello and welcome to episode 109 of the Chills of Will podcast. They're always treats, but this is a treat today to talk to Bryce Hedstrom. El Don, El Señor Bryce Hedstrom. He, who is he? He is El Padrino of Comprehensible Input, or CI, in the foreign language classroom and widely recognized as an outstanding world language teacher with more than 30 years of experience at all levels. A frequent regional, state, and national presenter, he is known for helping world language teachers to enhance their existing programs by incorporating many strategies that emphasize social awareness, interpersonal communication, and varied reading techniques in the classroom. Bryce is the author of High Impact Reading Strategies. In addition, he is the author of many world language instructional materials, teacher resources, and fiction and nonfiction for students. Bryce, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Oh, doing great, Pete. Thank you for having me on. I really oh, appreciate this. It's an, it's an honor to have you. I, I was telling you before we started recording that I uh, saw you in maybe like November 2018 up here in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you're a huge part of, of really overhauling our Spanish curriculum um, and improving it. And so I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Awesome. Yeah. And I hadn't realized that you were a Spanish teacher also. And I, is, besides your love for literature, I thought it was language arts and yes. you know, reading guy. But this is, this yes. is wow. Well, it language is language, is language, right? Yeah, exactly. Language is language. I just, I just had the chance the other night. Um, are you familiar with Father Greg Boyle? No, I'm not. He, he works with... I, I, I saw your interview. Yes. I saw it on YouTube, but I had, yeah. saw that it was there, but I didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, Fathers with uh, Homeboy Industries, which is the, the gang intervention, uh, all kinds of gang intervention programs. I mean, he's just, he's, he's, he's a hero. He's really, you know, the word hero is thrown around too much. But I got a chance to see him the other day. And, uh, you know, he's also, a, he's, he's a Spanish speaker. And he was hmm. talking about a word that he kind of discovered or rediscovered. This is just kind of going to this idea of, you know, how great language is and etymology, yeah. and his, you know, right? Um, the, word is, no, what, the word is acatamiento. 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 Right. So I think, you know, it's kind of meaning like you look it up, it'll be like a reverence type of thing. Mm. And he was talking about how he'd studied it as from St. Ignatius of Loyola, you know, back 500 plus years ago. And he would translate it as, Father would translate it as um, a, an affectionate awe. Hmm which I was like, how cool is that? You know, and then he talked about, you know, the verb acatar and all that. Yeah. And it's just like, wow. Like, I always feel like my English gets better by learning my Spanish. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah. Just so much richer. There's words that you can say in Spanish that exactly. you need a whole paragraph to explain in English. Exactly. Right. It's always funny to see like, an, like a translation or an interview. And it's like, you know, the English word is this long. And the Spanish yeah. ones this long, or sometimes vice versa, but, yeah. right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'd love to ask you how you uh, your love of of language, Spanish, um, you know, and literature got started. Where, um, you know, where did you grow up? How did you grow up? What was your relationship with with the written word? Oh, that's a great question. It's so dear to my heart. Um, comes from several places. My grandparents, my parents, and then, um, uh, and then. Uh, learning Spanish and, and being an exchange student in, in Chile. Oh, okay. um, so my, my grandparents always gave us books for our birthday. Nice. And, uh, you know, I still have many of them. And in fact, I, I was seven years old and my parents, my grandparents gave me Misty of Chincoteague. Hmm. And uh, is he going to pull it there? There it is. He'll have it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I read this. I'm like, oh, I love this. My parents bought me a pony when okay. we moved to Colorado. I named it Misty. You know, <laughs> oh, yes. named, she had a full and we named it Stormy because the next book in the series was Stormy Misty's okay. Full. And I had all those books. And uh, so thanks to my grandparents. That was huge. Yeah. And my parents flooded our house with magazines of all kinds. We had National Geographic, mm -hmm. um, Smithsonian, Colorado Outdoors, um, just all kinds of different magazines, Saturday Evening Post, mm. just our house was filled with, with, with things to read. Okay. And so that was, that was a big help. Another big help was, help was uh, I have three brothers and we were all very rowdy. And so we always had to have a quiet time every day. 
<laughs> and, so, and they said, you can do whatever you want, but you got to stay in your room and be quiet. And so we just read, you know, and so that helped a lot too. Um, and then, um, you know, with, with Spanish, it was a, it was a big thing. Uh, I graduated early from high school and I, I was also slow to mature. And so I didn't want to go to college looking like a middle school kid. I, I was that much aware. And so mm. I applied to be a, to be a, um, an exchange student and the Spanish teacher at our school was also the, my wrestling coach. Okay. And, um, and I said, Hey, would you, would you say I could speak Spanish, so, you know, to give me a recommendation so I can be okay. an student? And he goes, yeah, sure. And I didn't speak any Spanish, never took it. Es high school. Una mentira. Mentira. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh -oh. yeah. So, <laughs> so he, uh, he lied for me and uh, said, he goes, you know, how well do you want to be able to speak it? I go, well, you know, pretty good. Same <laughs> here. Intermediate or something. You know? And he goes, okay. And he wrote me a recommendation. I went to Chile and then, uh, you know, surprise, I couldn't speak the mm. language. Mm. And, uh, but I learned a lot, you know, I redid my senior year down there okay. at, um, at a uh, Catholic school. It turned out it's one of the best chains of schools uh, in all of South America. It's called the, the Sagrado Corazon schools, okay. the Sacred Heart schools. And, you know, they were, but I was a good student and I, it was all review. And so I could do everything well uh -huh. and, um, you know, and uh, had school six days a week, had 12 subjects Whoa. and, um, and the family I lived with, you know, I wanted to learn and, and they gave me a set of children's encyclopedias in Spanish mm. that were there. And they gave me the book, The Little Prince mm. in Spanish. And I'm like, they go, you should be able to read this as a kid's book. I'm like, I don't know any Spanish. You know, it's like, I'd read it before in English, but it's like, that was kind of the start of learning Spanish okay. combined with literacy too. So, mm. Wow. Well, I think that's like a perfect example. I try to explain sometimes to students about, well, I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of my students know very well, because a lot of them speak a second language, whether it is Spanish mm -hmm. or, or others, but, you know, obviously you cannot translate literally, right? So I always right. think of like small and little are a good example. So how would you say, I mean, the, the, is it el principito? Like, how would you say the little prince? Uh, in the Spanish version, it's called el principito. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, you know, like, like small businessmen, like the yeah. businessman isn't small, like Chiquito, yeah. it's a small business. So, is it, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. Did you get, did you get found out right away? I mean, did you like, did they say, Hey, wait a minute, you said you spoke Spanish, you speak nothing. Yeah. Well, like... they, they gave me a lot of grace. You know, okay. so I'm sure there was closed conversations behind my back. It's like, <laughs> Yeah. This is what they call intermediate levels. Right. For crying out loud, I didn't know anything. But <laughs> I, I feel like every country says it, or people say about every country. But I've heard Chile is like the fastest Spanish. How would you? How would you just talk about Ch Chilean Spanish in general? Like, how do you found it to be different? Um, you know, from what maybe you learned in the United States when you came back. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did. They tend to cut off the ends of their words. Oh, they, they have lots of slang. They everything is ito or itito. Uh, <laughs> like instead of chico or chiquito, it's chiquitito. Uh, you know, like it's the itty bitty or something like that. You know, okay. that's they would add that on every word. You know, mm, okay. And um, and so that you know, I, I learned the the fast Spanish, I guess. Okay, so right. It wasn't um, it wasn't tough when I came back, and they speak fairly. Um, they do have some slang but in general like their their accent mm -hmm. is not that different it's pretty pretty good spanish the people that i pretty much standard spanish i guess I, I see. the people huh. I, the schools i went to so do you have you found it have you found like chilean communities in the united states like are there big are there big communities in certain places that you've come in contact with you know i haven't the yeah. you know in around this area it's mainly from people from northern mexico uh-huh um, and there's a lot of Colombians that I run mm. into all the time. Mm. I'm not sure if they're, if they're more involved in education or what, but I haven't mm. run into too many people from Chile. I, huh. I still keep in contact with a couple of people yeah. there on Facebook. But, uh, oh, very cool. Yeah. What, um, as you got older into high school and into college, well, this was the end of high school, you said, in the college, yeah. um, what, what were you reading, whether it was in Espanol or not, who are some of the readers, some of the writers or types of, of work that really interested you? 
Um, that's a good question. When I was in college, I went to the University of Northern Colorado okay. where James Michener taught mm. as a professor, um, not at the time I was there, but they had this huge Michener library, the biggest right. library west of the Mississippi. Oh, wow. And uh, and so I was kind of naturally interested in that. Where and he wrote the book Centennial and they were filming it mm. um, when I was going to college. And many of the actors from that miniseries would come to the restaurant that I worked at at night. And so I would talk to the, and I'm like, hmm. you're lame beaver. Oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> that is so great. What a cool, a cool <laughs> character that was, you know? And, uh, and so I read uh, lots of James Mishner, you know? Okay. The, so the, the historical fiction, um, lots of his books. I mean, probably five or six of them. Wow. So Centennial, you know, was one for sure, you know? written it a couple times so because it, it's it's set here in northern colorado sure so, yeah I, I mean i know that i know the name and I, I, I mean aren't there like missioner fellowships and yeah yeah right but what yeah. um you, you talk about historical fiction i mean we're talking like like old west like how would you describe his work well you know james michener he goes his fiction is real historical fiction. he starts like back with the dinosaurs oh okay. you know and moves up, you know, through through time uh -huh. in one geographical spot. You know, he had Centennial, he has Texas, he has Mexico, Iberia, um, what about South South Africa? Um, I forget the name of that one. But um, but he, he starts, you know, way, way back in, you know, when the earth was formed and goes up mm -hmm. with his fiction. And just there's character after character that kind of overlap. Mm -hmm. through time but mm -hmm. it's mainly about place and geography which was my my uh, double major in college okay. spanish and geography oh nice. nice yeah so um am i correct that you're a you're a big godfather fan i am i am a big godfather what, fan. was the book better than the movie or what do you think oh yeah the book is way richer than the movie uh -huh. and uh yeah that was i I like the Godfather. A lot of wisdom in there, and how to get along with people. It's not all uh, criminality and violence. You know? Sure, there's, but, there, yeah, there's a decent amount of that too. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, there there are like there are a lot of characters in the book that never show up in the movie. You know, there's that. Yes, there's, yeah. There's, there's that doctor, like the plastic surgeon. There's uh, what's his name? Uh, Al Neary gets a lot more time in the book. Yes, you know, yeah. The, the, the you know, and uh, like, yeah. Sunny's paramour, you know, she she gets right. a little bit more time. Right, you know what that what that's about in the movie. So. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Oh man, um, so who were you know the teachers? I mean, did you have a lot of inspirational teachers? Did you have was were they, um, you know, were you inspired to be a teacher from you know your parents always pushing education? How did you get into teaching, and and who were the people who really um, impelled you in that way? Yeah, I love that question. I one of the big ones was my great grandmother. That's her one room schoolhouse bell that I inherited. Oh, nice! Of all the oh great great gosh. grandchildren, I got it. Whoa! And uh, she was uh, she she came over from Sweden, learned English, and then started teaching in one room schoolhouse in Kansas. Oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, that was the bell. That they called them in with so that's an honored place so that was always there my great my great grandmother was a teacher my grandfather was a teacher my mother was a teacher uh -huh. and now me but wow. um and i but i did have good teachers on the way one particularly with reading was mr pyle my sixth grade teacher who was short mm -hmm. shorter than me as a sixth grader and i wasn't tall at all he was oh probably gosh. i bet he was four foot eight yeah. you know little little guy wow, you know wow, wow. but uh, very tough and he would read to us after lunch and if we were paying attention and we're into it he would just keep reading mm -hmm. and we always thought we're fooling him. <laughs> yeah. you know but that helped me develop a love for reading and i reread many of those books later i mean mm -hmm. he read little britches by ralph moody man of the family by ralph moody hmm. and of green gables it wasn't always all boys book and green gables and, and other ones along those lines and it was just it really helped me instill in me a love for for yeah. reading oh that's so cool yeah, made oh, it I'm way good. easier when i read them on my own later uh -huh. so. 
I remember those days of just like you're reading just to read. So, I mean, I, thought, I think that's a good transition into like your, your philosophy and your own teaching. Like, I know a lot of what you talk about is like reading for the reading for the sake of reading, reading for hearing the words, reading for, you know, pleasure. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wonder how you how you've transferred that into like the Spanish classroom to the world language classroom, just about the importance of of reading is I got to figure you're somebody who's like, hey, if you're reading the cereal box, great. If you're reading, yeah. uh, you know, a billboard, great. If you're reading a libro in Espanol, great. Like, it's all good, right? How would you, yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth. How would you kind of talk about your philosophy of, of reading and teaching reading? Yeah, that's great. Um, reading for pleasure is where it's at. That's the most powerful kind of reading. So self-selected reading, free voluntary reading, you know, sustained silent reading, what, you know, extent, extensive reading is what the researchers call it. But, uh, you know, I just love that. And when I, you know, I, I built up a huge library in my classroom. Mm-hmm. I'm not in the classroom anymore. I just train teachers full time now right. and write. But, um, but um, I built up a, over the years, built up a huge library in my classroom yeah. and um, over a thousand books. Um, oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. In Spanish in my classroom. Hey. And so when I, when I retired, I gave 500 of them to a promising young teacher mm. um, in Denver and then and 200 to another teacher here in town mm. and kept some and just have slowly parsed, parsed them out to people mm-hmm. that I thought would really use them. But reading, uh, ind- independent reading is the most powerful way to, to get kids to absorb the language. It's painless. It's fun. It's... Um, it's enriching in just multiple ways. And so I, you know, I, I bought books uh, with my own money, you know, took money out of my own, my own children's mouths and <laughs> bought, and bought you know, no, and, uh, no piece of the night. Sorry. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Just go to bed. Yeah, and, uh, sure. you know, just bought a bunch of books and, uh, and later our, you know, made deals with our administrators to get even more books. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so that was that's that's the thing, and the, the the way you teach reading, you know, is this is my main way. Yes. Sit in front of them and read, you know. Yes. yes. And uh, you know that's if they see you reading, they read. I mean that's mm-hmm. like like the the simplest best way that I ever found, because mm-hmm. uh, kids don't see anyone reading. You know, I mean we talk about reading. And my own children, I talked about reading, but um, they never saw me read because I'd read early in the morning or late at night, never in front of them. Mm. You know, they knew we had some books in our house, but they never saw me reading them. Mm. And so that's a, it's, it's a big, big thing. And uh, today, my both my daughters are like insanely enthusiastic about reading. That's great. And um, but one of them is starting a, a school, a class, Whoa. a classical school. Um, in Denver, another one is starting. Another one um, just reads all the time and shares books, mails books to all her friends. Mm. And um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say another big influence on my reading and big epiphany was um, was uh, with our oldest daughter could read well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, my wife and I thought we were geniuses, you know, in teaching her to read. She's kind of picked up reading without even trying. Mm-hmm. But our youngest daughter was another case, and uh, she couldn't read, no matter what. And we 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 kept zeroing in, what's wrong? What's wrong? Went to psychiatrist, optometrist, you know, reading specialist, bought computer programs, all kinds of ex- books, everything. And um, um, turns out she couldn't process like what we would call the sight words or the mm-hmm. grammatical function words. Mm. like prepositions or pronouns right. you know just little the, the short words. Uh-huh. yeah right. she, she couldn't get those uh-huh. for some reason we'd say you know that you know and she's like at at what does that say and she, she's like horse you know she uh-huh. for some reason her brain couldn't process them, uh-huh. but she could read i remember specifically she could read the word alligator Whoa. in magazine sure. you know because it painted a picture in her head somehow. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh. And we were beside ourselves. 
I found the best reading teacher in our town and I, we transferred her to that school and her classroom. Mm. And, uh, you know, I mean, every once in a while, you know, you gotta pull in your favors, you know? I mean, there's a godfather. Hey, padrino, hey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got her in there mm -hmm. and the, the teacher said, you know, we'll, we'll test her, we'll look at her. She said, okay, after a week, she said, look, she's really, really bright. And she, uh, she's so bright, she can hear a passage read once and then pretend she's reading it. What? You know, she would volunteer to read. And then she would uh... act like she was reading it. <laughs> You know, and she goes, you know, her memory is helping her right now. Mm. But she said when she gets older, she's not going to be able to. She, this was when the start of fifth grade and she measured at the 0.5 reading level at the halfway through kindergarten level, sure. reading, which yeah. it should have been at 5.0. Uh -huh. And um, the teacher said, and I will never forget this. I get choked up on this. So um, she said, you got to promise me something. I said, OK, what? She's going to promise me right now. Promise mm. me. And I said, okay, I swear, what? Yeah. She said, you got to read to her. I said, we do read to her. She said, no, you got to read to her an hour every night without fail every day until she mm. tells you to stop. Mm. And we're like, okay. And so we did from the beginning of fifth grade, we read to her religiously every night until 11th grade, when she finally said, I can do it on my own, man. Wow. And uh, we read Salud. every Salud, what a beautiful thing. Wow. We read everything, stuff she wanted, stuff we wanted. Sometimes I get two exact copies from the library and she had one, I had one. Sometimes we just had one copy, she just sit on my lap or, or lay on the floor. Mm -hmm. And we would agree, we read Island of the Blue Dolphins and oh, yeah. you know, stuff like Anne, Anne of Green Gables again. Mm -hmm. uh, we read them twice. She goes, read it again <laughs> as soon as we were done. And so we did. We read, you know, The Hobbit. Lord of the Rings, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, all of those. Uh, oh man, what were those books? I blocked them in my head. The, the werewolf and yeah, vampire books. Oh, like so Twilight, even? No. Twilight, yeah. Yeah. That's how much I loved her. Um, <laughs> That's love, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> read those. We just read, read, read. And by the time she was in ninth, ninth grade, she no longer needed an IEP. And, uh, but we kept reading to her. You know, and if she had a book she had to read for school, To Kill a Mockingbird, mm -hmm. Huckleberry Finn, Romeo and Juliet, we'd read it. I'd read it to her and she would look, she'd look at it. And, wow. uh, and so that is where I realized how powerful this reading stuff is. Mm -hmm. And today um, she's 29 years old and uh, she's like fabulously successful. Uh, she's an interior designer that wonderful memory she had she developed mm. works for her like crazy she remember one little comment or one little piece of furniture mm -hmm. decorating idea that someone mentioned and and people just love her for it wow. and uh, so that that that's a big part of it too for me yeah. wow i'm speechless that's a beautiful oh, thing, beautiful thing on many levels right i can i bet i bet oh my gosh my uh my halfway through kindergarten just walked through the room and i'm just you know it's so fun to be on the journey with her she's learning to read and like you said the sight words and all that so yeah wow kudos to you and, and to her that's and, and to that teacher that's so so cool oh and that teacher here's the, the the best part that teacher came to her high school graduation oh man yeah man and her college graduation <laughs> the, the power of great teaching right yeah, I mean, that's that's a wonderful that's wonderful teaching. That's right lifelong there. learning, right there. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Wow. Um, as you as you got into teaching, you did you taught? I know you taught at the the college level. Did you teach high school first, or how did that work? What's what's the yeah? Uh, I started off reality? teaching in in middle school. Okay. Taught for eleven years, and then moved to high school for nineteen years. Mm -hmm. and uh, during that time i also taught at night at, at college yeah okay so it kind of okay. overlaps it's very reminiscent of one of my heroes my uncle uh, taught for i think 40 years at the high school level he would teach um weekends like you said at the, at the college level and uh, yeah. you know he would he would put together those trips every summer you know the classic spanish teacher trips yeah. The, yeah. to chile to argentina oh, yeah. mexico right so 
cheers to my uncle great great role model for me yeah i wonder like the kind of like the the idea of like the old school spanish if you will and, and i say old school is not that old and it's still being used in a lot of classrooms the yeah way that, the way that probably we were taught the way that i was taught and the way that I, I taught myself for years was you know conjugate these verbs learn this verb list um you know kind of grammar heavy grammar heavy and then you know conversation kind of as an afterthought i mean i'm kind of talking about the extremes of it doesn't yeah. have to doesn't have to be that way but um you know but but i guess that's kind of a good, good transition again to like comprehensible input and um you know the ways i mean that's how we learn our first language right we don't learn by what's the verb you know tell you know we learn the grammar stuff yeah. later right. right so you know it mimics the, the the ci of course mimics the way that we learn our first language so you yep. are the expert. I'd love to hear you talk about comprehensible input and how you made that that transition. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I was trained as a Spanish teacher. You know, my, my education, my major was Spanish in college. And, uh, and I was trained and a lot of the modeling was was that very kind of thing. The mm. Conjugation, memorize vocabulary list, things like that. Right. And then someday down the road, you'll be able to speak the language you know, uh -huh. after four years or something. Yes. Yeah five or whatever and um so that was that was my model and that's the, my other teachers my you know, student teaching experience and the teachers i worked with at the beginning of my career all taught that way and so I, that's what i thought we're supposed to do but uh i was very frustrated that my students didn't like the language and they didn't like me that much you know because i was beating them with whips you know mm -hmm. and um it's like they take the language so they can speak spanish right mm -hmm. and not so they can just study conjugations or do right. finger exercises as right. they call them <laughs> and um and so i was very frustrated this is only i'd only been teaching probably about five years probably at the time and i i happened to see and got a brochure you know, learn a new way to teach and it was blaine ray wow. and we we're down in, in littleton uh it was at a rec center in littleton and i went down there and um, gosh, this was probably, I want to say 1994, 95, something like that. Okay. And, uh, and there was a lot of people who went on to be kind of big things in, in Colorado and some nationwide in this one little workshop that he did. And it was, I was like, oh man, I learned a whole story in Chinese in, in the morning in like an hour and a half. Cool. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. Mm -hmm. And so I bought some of his materials while I was down there and I went back. And, you know, I, I had one class that was just filled with miscreants and hoodlums and kids that didn't want to learn. And I said, I, I couldn't do any worse. Like the, the, these kids don't know anything anyway, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I'm going to try it. I tried it with them. And within like weeks, they were loving the language, loving me able to speak enthusiastically coming to class and doing the work it could speak in circles anyone else with the other language so i was doing two lesson plans at the same you know mm -hmm. one for this fourth hour but a bunch of uh, kids and um, and then my other ones and so i just switched shortly after after spring break i just switched all to right. teaching with uh teaching with uh, tprs is what it was at the time Mm. but um it was uh that's that's how it started and i i went to many 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 <laughs> i mean i was like almost inset, crazy about this i went to a total of 22 either conferences workshops college classes seminars you know different different things like that until i felt like i really understood this mm -hmm. and uh, every time one of these speakers like Susan Gross or Blaine Ray or Stephen Krashen, who I'd like to talk about more oh, later, wow. yeah. um, was in the area, uh, I went, you know, and they would always be looking at, there he is again, sitting right in the front row, you know, taking notes. And, uh, and so I really was crazy devoted to learning about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's kind of how, how it started. And then I, you know, I started using it with my college students. Um, Tech, experimental techniques mm -hmm. that I wasn't sure I could use with my high school students or middle school students. Mm -hmm. 
because I thought if, if it fails, you know, if it fails in middle school or ninth grade class, right. oh my gosh, you're going to have right. a bedlam in your hands. Right. So um, I would try it with my college students and kind of perfect the techniques and, and then I would use it in the, in the lower, lower levels. And it worked really, really well, um, just fantastically well. I expanded it to teaching um, in high school, uh, Spanish three, four, and AP, and it worked wonderfully well with them. Mm -hmm. And um, my students passed AP even the first year that I ever taught it. You know, mm -hmm. they passed at a much, much higher rate than the national um, rate for non-native speakers. Mm. And so it was. Um, I was very encouraged by that. And so I, I kept, I wrote materials and, and uh, just, it's kind of grown from there. So, yeah, no. well, that's, that's for sure. Um, did that, did that come fairly naturally to you? Like when you talk about like TPRS, you know, the names have kind of changed over the years, but it's the idea that you're, you know, you're acting things out, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, ojo, ojo, clase. Yeah. Sí, sí. Oh, no, es, es, es tu ojo. No, no, es mi ojo. Ojo. Yeah. You know, right? I mean, that's unlimited. I mean, a very uh, basic example. Did that right. come naturally to you, like to, to be kind of dramatic? And, you know, I, I feel like I've done things as a teacher, not just with TPR, that I never would, the 17 year old me would have said, Are you, you know, I, I'll sing a song if I have to to get into, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do different voices, you know. So I wonder how that, that transition was or, or, if that, you know if that was easier for you or not yeah that's that's interesting to think of you know I, I think i had a real just by being lucky I had a real head start i was involved in drama in high oh, school nice. a lot you know i was in a lot of plays and and um, i'm also very musical my mother was a music teacher mm -hmm. and uh you know so i played guitar and piano and, mm -hmm. and trombone and uh, so that kind of performing aspect of it helped mm. i also like to draw i've illustrated one of my books oh, called cool. convicciones and i've illustrated several most of my books actually yeah but uh but um that that stuff kind of helped you know to make it comprehensible to draw a quick picture mm -hmm. in fact i do that here in my office slash yes, studio yes, 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 yes. On my whiteboard uh -huh. but um but yeah, so it helped to be able to draw, helped to be able to sing, you know, and, and, and you know, to ham it up and be fun and lively, you know, just, mm -hmm. just start singing the hokey pokey or sing mm -hmm. head and shoulders, knees and toes mm -hmm. in Spanish to them right. And, right. and get them up and moving. And, you know, it's like, you know, senior headstrom's crazy. I guess we would be crazy too. So. Yes. But yes. Have, I don't know if you found this to be your experience. I would, I would guess yes. I so many times I'm teaching what again, whatever subject I've taught, it's like, okay, dang, this is going to be way too childish for them. Oh man, they're juniors or they're seniors. It's never too childish, right? No, it never ever, is. Ever. Yeah. With lower middle school, it could be too childish because they're very sensitive about yes. being called little kids. Yeah. It, but, right. That makes sense. Nobody yeah. else. Mm -hmm. With adults or high school, upper middle school or high school, no way it's too childish. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you maybe give a little summary of what what is comprehensible input what is what is ci oh great um comprehensible input comes from the the work of stephen Krashen, basically although again he would credit other people but uh -huh. but Krashen, um he's a fact, celebrity in teaching circle in education circles, he right? sure is yeah he uh i got this book shortly oh. after began teaching oh yeah oh yeah natural approach and so this was written, this was written like 1980s sometime. Uh, and uh, boy, he wrote, it's just, this is kind of the, his, my first, my first um, introduction to it. Mm -hmm. And the word comp you know, comprehensible input comes from mm -hmm. Stephen Crash and saying that um, languages are acquired in one way by understanding messages in mm -hmm. the language comprehensible input and so you have you know whatever you need to add to that whether acting it out drawing mm -hmm. context is the main way once you give enough words um that's how people acquire language is by understanding messages comprehensible input mm -hmm. and so it can't just be input you can't just speak spanish to them and hope they'll get it mm -hmm. and it's not and it 
and it's not just only comprehensible because that the ultimate of comprehensible to an English speaking students would be speaking English to them the whole period. Sure. It has to be target language that they can understand most of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's, that's where, that's where comprehensible input comes from. And there's lots of uh, misnomers with it right now mm-hmm. too. I, th- I think, you know, I, I heard, I've heard math teachers talking about comprehensible input. I've heard, you know, it's like, that doesn't mean the exact mm-hmm. same thing. So yes, they need to understand what you're talking about, but yeah. I don't think it totally means the same thing. Um, some people have taken to, to mean that you can just stand in front of them and talk, just stand in front of them and talk you know, all day, every day, and they'll somehow magically get the language, you know. Uh-huh. Um, there's a give and take, you know, they, mm-hmm. they need to, they acquire it by listening, they acquire it by comprehensible input for sure, mm-hmm. but it motivates students to be able to speak and they want to speak. When I'm learning a new language, I want to be able to speak it. I want to blurt out answers in the language. And, uh, and so we need to allow students to produce language at as high of a level as they can. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, instead of only making them listen. And I'm, I see a lot of that in my travels and talking to teachers that for some reason, you know, I guess because they get the idea of the comprehensible input. Okay, people mm-hmm. acquire by comprehensible input. Got it. Mm-hmm. And then they they think that's all that should be done. Just listen to the teacher or read. And they think it's all that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. I think there's more to it than that. Um, but so so what, I mean, what what does that mean if like okay, like I'm teaching a short story, let's say maybe it okay. could be could be like a, a childish one or whatever. It could be um could be whatever. So am I like am I stopping every, you know, after acting it out and using context and drawing and that kind of thing? Am I like stopping and saying, Clase, como se llama la persona? And then having sure. two or three people repeat it, like, w- what kind of questions would you ask? Let's say you're doing a short story, like I said. Yeah. Are you asking like plot questions? Are you asking like, que piensas de, de este? Or, like, yeah, good question. Um, you can mix it up, you know. Mm. And what I, what I advocate is asking different levels of questions to different students. Okay, right. Mix it up to different, to differentiate your question, you know, mm-hmm. and don't, don't let, Sally superstar raise her hand and answer every single question mm-hmm. if she's the superstar say no wait wait mm-hmm. I, w- I will pick you know I'm going to say one person una persona mm-hmm. you know and then you pick you ask you're, you ask the question you say una persona one person mm-hmm. you ask the question no put your hand down I will pick you and then you ask the question to somebody so you ask the question so everyone's thinking and getting reps in their heads. Mm-hmm. You know, those repetition is how, how they learn. Mm-hmm. But then you ask one particular student that's targeted because you know your students, you know who's at what level. Mm-hmm. In the softball questions, what's the girl's name? Mm-hmm. Does she like her cat? You know, mm-hmm. does something, little thing like that mm-hmm. that are easy to answer from, from the story. Ask them that. But then mid-level, ask them something a little bit harder, you know? Um, ask them, you know, what, what's the difference between like these two words that we, we used okay. a word that sounds like we use the word ha- has TNA mm. and how is that different from TNAs mm-hmm. you have, you know? Mm. And so just, just to get them, what's the difference between TNA and TNAs? We use TNA. What's that? What do you mean? What is that? And just so a middle level kid, Make sure they're distinguishing between things in, in, in the, uh, the story. High level kids say, what, would, what if we wanted to say something different and have them produce the language at a high level mm-hmm. that, that's above course level? Because mm-hmm. three or four kids in every class could do that. We can't act like they're all exactly the same. Right. So I, um, that's okay. one way to do it. You know, another way is to, uh, is to think of... Uh, different uh, levels of thinking uh, like the bloom blooms taxonomy mm-hmm. and ask you can ask simple memorization questions you know how many dogs does the girl have you know and then move on up the ladder for understanding and analysis and get all the way up to creation mm. of, of unique 
sentences and stuff. And so that's another way I would differentiate it with 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 different kids. What what if uh, you know, using like the tiene tienes um, example, right? Yeah. What if what if a student knows that a student knows tienes para Bryce tiene y tú tienes? He knows that, mm -hmm. but he can't he can't say it in Spanish. Is saying it in English better than nothing, or is it not? Yeah. Or is that going to? It is. Yeah, I'd let him say it in English. I mean, uh -huh. you're only doing it for just a split second. Uh -huh. Ninety five yeah. percent of the time, you're in the target language. Uh huh. But just just for those quick comprehension checks. Yeah. Let them do it. Or when they ask a question, when they say, what is the difference? Because uh, an English has or takes uh -huh. or wants ends with an S. Uh -huh. but, but in Spanish, yeah. you want ends with an S. Why is that? Like, right. let them ask questions. Right. Um, but many times you need to prompt them by asking them questions and yeah. getting them thinking. Yeah. So, Man, as a, as a non-native speaker, when I learned the word agarrar, oh, yeah. my life changed, man. <laughs> I, that, that's a great example of like a word that I feel like is so practical that you know didn't necessarily oh, learn, is. you know it's not in the yeah. spanish textbook but it's like if you want you know you want to speak it when you you know the majority of students when they leave high school or college they're not going to write poems in spanish they're not going to write you know answer questions on paper they're going to speak it so right it's like you, you want you want to use those words that are used in, in speech exactly I'm, right it's a good one how about yeah. the connection between uh, classroom management and CI? Oh man, that is, lots of people need help with that. Um, and that's yeah. kind of one of my strengths, one area that I've really worked on mm -hmm. because students can get the idea, this is like kindergarten class. You just, we're just, we're only goofing around all the mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. because I, I obviously want them to have fun. I want mm -hmm. them to enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. I want a low effective filter. You know, it's like we're all enjoying right. ourselves here. We're liking being together. Mm -hmm. We're laughing. We're having, we're just having a great time. And so some students interpret that as it's all, it's a free for all, you sure. know? And so, oh my gosh, we can't, we can't do that. So, um, so I, I've, you know, I've discovered a lot of ways to keep things in, in shape, you know, and I taught, Turns out now I had the good fortune of teaching at some schools that were really, really low academically mm -hmm. and even where education was not the greatest, the highest priority, mm -hmm. um, you know, sports was, where, which is lots of schools nowadays, sure. you know, but, um, you know, like we would jokingly say, like, our main job is just to make sure they're eligible for sports. Mm -hmm. that's, that's our job as teachers. <laughs> and um and so I had lots of behavior problems, especially teaching with, with uh, comprehensible input and stories. And uh, so I had to develop lots of, um, do a lot of research on it and mm -hmm. experimentation. Mm -hmm. And so what helped me a lot was routines and like, especially the, the bookends of starting the class in a real structured way and ending the class in a real structured way. Mm -hmm. And then kind of moving in from there. And the way I like to start class is by passwords. I wrote a book on that called yeah. What's the Password? Yeah. And um, from observing other teachers, you know, observing a couple of great teachers in California mm -hmm. and uh, just expanding on that and experimenting. But they have to line up and greet me at the door with their password. And, um, and you know, they all know it. It was told to them on Friday and it's good for them all whole next week. Mm -hmm. But they, it really is a, it's a good way to connect with each student. Yes. You look in the eye, you know, shake hands if you if you're allowed to, touch them on the shoulder if you're allowed to. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's a wonderful way to connect with each kid, mm -hmm. and they feel like they're important to you. Yeah. You know, there'd be a kid with a piece of food on the mouth. You can tell them. You know, a kid that's looking sad. A kid that they got their braces off, but nobody's saying anything. Uh, they got a haircut, nobody's saying. They got some new shoes. Right. Nobody said you're the only one that notices in the whole school. Yeah. And uh, there's research that says that um, teachers that greet their students at the classroom door every day have a 39 percent more engagement with content. Wow. It's like that's a between. Sounds like a difference between that almost an F and an A hmm. to me, you know, hmm. in, in how yeah. much they listen to you because you yeah. listen to them. They almost can't help it. It's, a, it's, oh, it's like, man. to me, it's like an instinctive deep brain kind of thing. Sure. So, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think the, the password thing works just marvelously well. Also, um, 
you know, give them a little sponge activity without fail every day, same place in the, same place on the board, same number of questions. Okay. And you have to have that done, you know, within a minute after the bell rings. Mm -hmm. And you can even ask someone else what the answer is. I don't care, you know. Sure. But you're just this is not a quiz. We're just engaging with Spanish, being reminded of uh -huh. what we were doing yesterday. And so that's, that's cool. Yeah. And so that's a real structured thing. And so they also have something to do while you're out in the hall greeting them. Mm. And at the end, did I get this book? I set out so many books. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, this one. Got this idea from this book. Okay. The Talent Code. Hmm. You heard of this? I have not. Oh, get it. About it. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's how the brain... It grows, it, it, it's how, how to, to grow talent and, and expertise in people. Mm -hmm. And um, Daniel Coyle is the author. But in here, just one little thing um, is how this Japanese teacher ended class. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And you do this, you say it in the target language, but you say class and they say, yes, sir. And you, I, I get in front, I bow to them actually. I say, thank you for learning. Mm -hmm. And they all say in unison, thank you for teaching us. And I say, my pleasure. Goodbye. That's how they know that class is over. And so that's a you know, real super structured bookend, you know, beginning of right. class and class. The middle, there's lots of room for creativity in different mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. they know for sure that something is under control, you know, at the beginning mm -hmm. and at the end. And then, you know, you... you uh, just institute different ways of keeping them on track, you know, wow. expecting them to speak in, in the target language is a big one, you know. I think you might've modeled the, the gracias por, por que aprender. Gracias por enseñarnos, yeah. Uh -huh. I think you might've been gracias modeled for that, the conference. That, that's so cool. My, uh, my great colleague, Dulce and Teresa, my school, they, they do the, uh, the passwords. I've fallen off a bit since since we've come back since COVID. I got to get back into it. Uh, I know Dulce this week was Sea Amable. Sea oh, amable. yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go, That's go, good. Go. Yeah, my, the very yeah. first one I ever teach him in, mm -hmm. in level one, first week is mm -hmm. Muy Amable. Uh huh. You know? I mean, because we want them to be kind to each other, you know, yeah. loving to each other. Yeah. That's what we're, you know, you're sharing your values with them yeah. as, you know, along with the password. Right. And, you know, upper levels have snippets of poetry, wise sayings, mm -hmm. bits of history, mm -hmm. things like that. But, yeah. but it's, it's wonderful. So oh, that's great. What about like, um, you know, you know, they get, they're talking, they're, they're, they're over social, they're, you know, they're not, they're ha you're having trouble getting their attention. You know, it's so much easier maybe to say, you know, listen up, please, versus atención, por favor. Although even as I say that, I feel like I've said that enough that they, you know, that is something they respond to. But I wonder about like, you know, not that it's yelling and screaming, but like when you really are trying to get their attention, um, how you, is that just about building that in repeatedly that you do it in the target language? It is. And you have to, I think you have to explicitly do it and kids will fall off the wagon, you mm -hmm. know, and you'll have to retrain them. But sure. my go-to thing is the call and response. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you mentioned this uh, father, Greg Boyle, you know, like the, this is something like the, that these liturgical churches like the Catholic church have figured out call right. and response. Right, right, right. They've done this for thousands of years, you know, uh -huh. they, the pastor says something, everybody responds with something, you know, and um, this can work in a classroom setting too. My go-to is I say classe and they say, si senor, you know, but you can say little things too, you know, say, you say cl classe and boca cerrada, you know, <laughs> in a closed mouth. And they no all entran, say, no entran las moscas. No entran moscas, right. You know, flies do not enter, uh -huh. right. And so give them an authentic saying like that where they can respond to you, mm -hmm. you know, okay. or you know, I, I goof around with them. You know, I say, instead of just saying classe, I say class, I go classe, classe, <laughs> you know, and, and they answer, si senor, si senor, I go classe. <laughs> Or, you know and just so do just do different fun kind of things like that say mm -hmm. we're having fun but we're also focusing you guys uh -huh. and uh, yeah. so you do so you're absolutely right you do have to have ways to get their attention right. back uh -huh. if you've given especially if you're giving them a task where they're speaking to one another mm -hmm. 
and they're actually doing what you ask them to do. Yeah, exactly. I think I think people who are not teachers don't understand. Sometimes sometimes they're they're rowdy, but it's like because they're into the yeah into the you know into the lesson right be- better than them sleeping you know yeah no uh, kidding. Um, so we you know we've really uh, focused our our curriculum on La Persona Especial with a lot of you know great help from you. The the interviews, the La Persona Especial interviews. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those. Yes, absolutely. Um, wow. Um, so do you, to, do you want to do an example? Um, we can yeah. do it after. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I'll let me. You act like you're a, and okay. you act like you're a kid. Okay. 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 I can do that. I can do that. All right. <laughs> you got some example in your mind, and I'm, I'm okay. not even going to tell you what kind of kid. Okay. Because this is the kid I can handle, right? <laughs> um, with these, I'm going to use them and say, okay. I say, hola, you know, me, me amo. Senior head stem. I also have a poster, by the way, on the wall. Uh-huh. Questions and the answers. See sí. the, the main ones. Let's say, may almost senior head stem. Como te llamas? Uh, and me, you can look right there and you shine your laser on it and answer, me llamo. Me, me llamo Pete. Pete. Hola, Pete. Hola. See, Pete. Um, see, Pete. Um, Pete is tu nombre completo. Oh, it, per- it was Peter Petrov. Uh, Pedro. Per- See, Pe- Pe- Peter. See, me llamo Peter. Me llamo Peter. Me llamo Peter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Te llamas Peter. Sí. Pero prefieres. Does that sound like an English word to you, Peter? Uh huh. Pre- pre- yeah. Prefer. Prefieres. Uh-huh. Te llamas Peter. Uh-huh. Pero prefieres Pete. Sí. Sí. Pre- prefieres. Sí. Sí. Prefieres Pete. No. No. Prefiero Pre- Pete. Prefiero. Perfecto. Muy bien. Okay. Prefiero Pete. Uh-huh. All right. Then you say class A, you turn, face mm-hmm. your hips to the class. Because mm-hmm. that's where you're mean in business is the hips. <laughs> and you say, I say, class A, si sí, senor. Este chico se llama Peter. Pero prefiere Pete. Mm-hmm. This is uno, dos, tres. Hola, Pete. Okay. Uh, okay. He says with them, you know, and so the sweetest sound that anyone ever hears is their own name. Yeah, mm. straight from Dale Carnegie, how to win mm. friends with people. Mm-hmm. And so you're saying his own name to him over and over and over. Make sure everyone knows his name. Mm-hmm. That's the first step. Now, with only saying your name right now, I can't tell anything about you. You didn't lean in or anything, or you didn't, there was no sparkle in your eye. Mm. And so I can't follow up, but as soon as the kid leans in a little bit, and as soon as there's a little sparkle in their eye, and that's a mm-hmm. literal thing, you get a little bit more, you know, just expression on their face, or just, but there's a little bit more fluid mm-hmm. in their eye when they're mm-hmm. in, interested in something, or, or their eyes dilate, sometimes you can even see mm-hmm. it. And when that happens, drop your lesson plan, drop everything, and mm-hmm. follow up like crazy on, on that. Okay. Um, you know, I, you, it'll happen at different times. You may have to ask several questions. Mm-hmm. Like, how old are you? Oh, you're 15. Oh, you're 16. Oh, if they're 16, what do you obviously ask them? Yo recuerdo de, de tu conferencia que es, okay. eh, tienes, yeah. tu, tienes tu licencia? Right, uh-huh. exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. the non-speaker, non-speakers can understand what he said, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have your license? You know, mm-hmm. that's exactly what you ask them. You know, you mm-hmm. don't say, "Do you have a dog?" You're 16, and oh, do you have a dog? Oh, you know, I mean, you're just some crazy, unrelated thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if they're if they're 16. That's a big cultural marker, you know, in our culture, that to get their license. You know, mm-hmm. and then it's many communities. Do you have a car? Um, you know, ours was kind of rural and they, they, were, they had, there was lots of old pickups around. They could buy an old pickup and fix it up. Mm. You know, a 15 year old boy mm-hmm. that almost I ever knew had, did that. Mm-hmm. So they owned a car before they even turned 16. Mm-hmm. So, so depending on your community, you know, you ask these follow-up kinds of questions, sure. you know, some of the best. And, and if a kid doesn't want to speak, I was kind of hoping that you would be a, like a reluctant student. You know, and not uh, say much. You know, I could do because that. if that happens, you say that's fine. We'll talk to you later. We'll come back to you. Uh huh. You know, it's like, uh-huh. you know, I understand. Not everybody wants to talk, and it's like, and if they're if they're just playing you, 
mm. then they're going to be kind of sad. <laughs> but some, <laughs> some will be relieved, you know, that oh, I don't have to talk, you know, I'm not going to. They're not going to make me talk. Uh huh. And um, um, and then you just you go around the room and just interview different kids, you know, and eventually the language level grows. And you can have, you can find out 15 or 20 things about a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next day you have a, have a quiz about them where they write out sentences about the, about the kid. So you keep it, you keep it more open-ended for the question. Yeah. It's, it's not como se llama la, la persona. It's tell me about, tell me two yeah. things about him or something like that. Yeah, no, you, well, if we learned, you know, you review it a lot. Mm -hmm. Don't just do it once. You, you, uh, you know, check with them and make sure you understand, report it to this, to the class, this mm -hmm. just in, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, and that, that, that's wonderful linguistically because you, you're doing the first person and second person when right. I'm talking to the interviewee and then you report to the class. Yes. That's third person. Yes. You know, and so they're hearing the different conjugations on, in the language. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really, really helpful. And, um, I was going to answer a question and I forgot where I was going. I interrupted myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you're dropping some incredible knowledge. So like, are you, I mean, isolate has a negative connotation. Are you, are you spotlighting the student? Like, do you have la persona especial, una persona like up in the seat? Or One person, like, yeah. Uh-huh. So is that, yeah, is that person. somewhere you're okay with that person saying like, I'm not, is, today's not my day and like sitting down. Yes. Yeah. They can totally pass. Uh -huh. I won't judge them. I won't give them a bad look or any mm -hmm. bad body language. So it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to you later. Uh -huh. You know, and I've never, ever had a kid pass the first time and then pass the second time. But when we go around the whole class and come back to them like two, three months later, sure. Um, I've never, ever had someone wow. refuse to go again. Wow. And, um, and it is, you know, they have the choice of sitting in front. Most kids like to sit in front and be the spotlight. Mm -hmm. But they can sit in their own seat if they want. That's fine. Yeah, sure. Why not? Right? You know, but because I tell people you have to take off your teacher hat and put on a party hat when you do mm -hmm. this. That's for sure. Like you're at a party mm -hmm. and you're, you're meeting these amazing people that are incredibly talented and accomplished. But, which is going to be your your own students in about 15 years, by the way. Sure. You know? And so you're interviewing. You're, you just want to talk about them. You're meeting some famous novelist. You're not going to talk about your own, you know, how you replace the gutter on your house or some <laughs> stupid thing, you know. You're going to ask them, where do you come up with your ideas? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your process? What, what are you working on now? Mm -hmm. You know, what's your fav favorite thing you've ever written? Like all the, sure. the kind of questions you ask people, you know, sure, sure, that's sure. what you're going to do. You're going to ask them about themselves and you would be a natural person, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but you just keep asking, asking, asking us follow up questions is what it's about. So mm -hmm. for the persona special, I have a list of qu suggested questions you could do, but the miss application of it is just go straight down the list and keep asking questions yeah that that's kind of boring but if you get you know you start asking follow-up questions mm -hmm. that's where kids start revealing things to themselves i mm have -hmm. a recent example that i've been giving in my my seminar for the last year or two about a girl named ashley that um her name her name was spelled wrong on her birth certificate because her mother didn't speak English well. Mm. And you go, oh, do you have a dog, Ashley? You know, no. Are you? No, no. no <laughs> what no. does your mom speak? Oh my no. gosh, her mom spoke no. Chinese. We learned. No. We had like 15, 16 uh, sentences we learned about Ashley. Wow. In that class, and that was her private shame that no one knew, mm. and everyone would have sworn they knew her. They'd gone to school with her for, for nine years mm -hmm. in a small mountain community. Mm -hmm. And they, they would have sworn they knew everything about her, but they didn't. Mm. Um, they didn't know what she was secretly ashamed of, that her name is spelled wrong on her, on her birth certificate because of her, her mom, who she thought was so stupid. We were like, oh, your mom, you, Ashley, you speak English, Chinese, and now Spanish? Mm -hmm. You know, where can Ashley go in the world and speak? Like yeah. almost every place. Right. with those three right, right 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 you know wow is I, I mean what a what a revelation what an incredible you know process to get there like 
how do you i mean i mean thank goodness that spanish has so many cognates right like i could see the driver's yes. license one like oh tienes tu licencia and i could pull right. mine out like how yeah. did you how how would you get to like she misspelled my my name you know like how do you get to that um and again is that well, okay I, with a little bit of english yeah yeah you i mm -hmm. in every interview I, I say you know let them use like five words of english yeah 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 you know don't and mainly spanish. and write those write the equivalent on the board in spanish but mm -hmm. don't don't let them use 20 you know sure, it's too many. sure sure and they're going to need a few words and this the students will associate those words with that person uh -huh. especially if you're reviewing enough you know another technique i like to do comes easy to me is the colombo technique <laughs> you act like you don't remember you know yeah same. you know if you know colombo you know <laughs> And, you know, this detective act, who acted stupid, but he was actually smart. And you're just like, wait a minute. And he said, what did you say? You, you're, you're 15 or 16. That's right. Okay, you're 16. You know, and then you just you just act like you don't get some things. Like, I'm just uh -huh. for you, my own self because I just forget everything. Uh -huh. But what you're doing is you're giving extra repetitions to the class. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Uh, of the language and of also the facts. Because the facts is what they're going to be quizzed on tomorrow. Sure. And... Um, and yeah, it's output, but they have the sentence starters on the wall. Uh -huh. And I don't care if they copy those sentence starters right off the wall. Some uh -huh. students need that. Yeah. The slow students need it. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't want to leave the slow students behind. But your faster students, they won't even look at them after two days. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, and those, are, those aren't the answers anyway. You know, and people say, why do you have the answers on your wall? So that's, those aren't answers. Mm -hmm. The answer is, Ashley, you know, say I'm Ashley, mm. you know, sí. you know, say I'm a Peter, Prefieri Pete. Mm -hmm. That those are the two sentences. That's two sentences right there. Sí. That's that's really what the question is. If they said, say I'm a Eric, you know, that's wrong, even if it's correct Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing is the language is piggybacking on while we're communicating. And that's what's natural language use, kind of coming back, you know, like your comment at the beginning, like with comprehensible input, it's the natural way to learn language. We mm -hmm. learn language while we're communicating about important things. Right, right. Oh, man, thanks so much for that, that explanation. The, I don't know what the translation is in Spanish, but we, we use your rejoinders very, very often. You know, I, I wonder, like, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to improve my usage of it. I feel like it's kind of, it's kind it's canned i need to you know more like in in the uh in the process of but like you know that'd be something like you know you would say right like uh yo soy de, de tokyo japón originalmente oh wow que chido que yeah right exactly. right yeah so, I mean, are you are, is that the students yeah. just is that the students blurting it out is that you saying clase que, you know que piensan or you've gotten used to that that's que piensan or, yeah. or or tienen comentarios or like how do you how do you get the rejoinders in there that's a great question. I try to get rejoinders two ways. One, rejoinders that I would use naturally. Mm -hmm. Like I goof around a lot with my students. And so I have lots of kidding type rejoinders, like mm -hmm. es un chiste, you know, it's a joke. Sí. No realmente, not really. You know, mm -hmm. no that's not, not really true. You know, it's like I'll say something and I'm like, nah, nah, I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they, stuff I would say, and that they would get kind of natural repetitions too, but then things that they would say too. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't whine, that's not fair very often, you know? Uh, uh, but that's a favorite among students, right? You know? And so you teach them, no es justo, yeah. no es justo, uh -huh. you know, with the whine in your voice and teach mm -hmm. them something they would say anyway. Mm -hmm. And so get, get a set of those that fit with your personality and with your students personalities and the lingo they kind of use mm -hmm. try to think of ones that correspond in the language for example like in in english if kids say that sucks you know we no longer think that's like a horrible cussing or mm -hmm. really low class way of speaking like everybody says it now mm -hmm. but in spanish mean culture that's not appropriate mm -hmm. it's not good to say you know so i instead of saying esto chupa or something i would say <laughs> esto pesta. that uh, stinks you know so use a corresponding phrase in yeah, the time yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. um and so that um, teach them those teach them two or three 
or up to five at uh, one in a week. Don't teach mm-hmm. them 50 at once. Mm-hmm. Teach them those and then use them during the week, keep them posted and then have a quiz on them on Friday. Uh-huh. That just gives a little bit of extra concern to them yeah. and um, just have them write the meaning in English, whatever, you know, first. But they will start remembering all of them. And then here's the, the thing you get when these little clickers. This is really lucky it's in my office. Um, <laughs> nice. You got. Uh, yeah. In the plastic bag and everything? Yeah. Man. One of these clickers, okay. Okay. counter, baseball pitch counter. Uh huh. Get in the baseball section of your uh, sporting goods store. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, they count pitches or hits or strikes. Or mm-hmm. Give this, get like three or four of these, put them on different colored lanyards. Uh-huh. One kid with a red lanyard, whatever. His classroom job is to count the number of rejoinders you say i expect 30 rejoinders this week uh, you know, they may only know like five or six rejoinders you know but i expect 30 or 40 40 of them to be 30 to be used this week uh-huh. and then just keep up in it so you get like expect 100 every class period mm-hmm. you know and then if they get 100 that's like one point or one minute or two minutes or whatever of extra mm-hmm. game time on Friday or something. Mm-hmm. But um or or just to show that they're better than the other classes, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, these are this is really a okay, yeah. It's cool, it's low tech. Yeah. You know, of course there's apps on their phone that get to this, but I do not want them to have their phones in class because they'd be screwing around looking yeah. something else up, right? Yeah. So uh so anyway, yeah, nice. do that and expect them to use them is the thing. Nice. And then, yeah. you know, yeah. This kid count them, yeah, and uh, make it a tough kid. That's like, no way, you know, <laughs> you know that you're just going down the list. That wasn't even a real right. appropriate rejoinder, you know. Right. It doesn't right. count, right. you know. Give them the power of doing the clicks, you know. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a good thing. I'm giving you a whole seminar here, man. I oh didn't... man, I'm I'm taking I'm taking mental <laughs> notes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna man I'm. I'm going back to the passwords. Um, I appreciate the help with the rejoinders about how to do them. I, I, I just remember now the idea of like getting a certain number and so they can come at different times. Yo, yo, tengo, yeah. un, yo tengo un chiste para ti. ¿Está bien? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. No recuerdo mucho, pero um, como, ¿qué dice la uva verde a la uva morada? ¿Qué dice la uva verde a la uva morada? Um, no sé, some blanco y tinto or something. I don't no, know. No. Respi- no? Respira, tonto. Respira. Oh, <laughs> okay. Respira. So, so, Breathe. Right? Yeah. Breathe, stupid. So, yeah. you, so you, you have a joke book. Um, yes. You have, you know, you have La Leyenda la, de la Llorona. Yes. You know, you've uh, you've written a few. You um, you know, part of your the website is you know help you know great writers like AC Quintero. I've had a, I teach her book. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I teach Como Salir de la Son de los Amigos. Yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what about just like about reading? You know, whether they're jokes, whether they're you know folk tales, whether they're you know, I guess too like the balance between culture. Like um, AC has some really interesting thoughts about like you know about teaching culture through books when you mm-hmm. need to, when you don't need to. I wonder how you get like, how you get across culture. What are you trying to do with the reading? Yeah, great question. The, the, the two most important things is that the reading is comprehensible and interesting or, you know, comprehensible and compelling and then cultural is the ultimate, you know, three C's. But if you gotta leave one off, you can leave off the culture. You don't have to do the culture every single time. Okay. Um, it's great when the whole book revolves around the culture or the, mm-hmm. you know, the target culture as well as the target language. But um, you don't have to, like a lot of AC Quintero's books that we have on our website mm-hmm. are, they're not all cultural, you know, they're just good stories that kids right. like to read. Right. You know, it doesn't always have to be about some girl that goes to Argentina, you know, mm-hmm. or learns a life lesson when she goes mm-hmm. to Guatemala or something, you mm-hmm. know, it doesn't have to be that. That's kind of nice. And, I was teethed on those in, in 
sure. You know, by playing Ray Boots, you know, Paul Brianna and Cassie and Wayne. Paul Brianna. You know, yeah. So I like teaching those books because um, I can add a lot to them, you know. Right. But that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we're doing uh, we're doing Los Novios right now. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Uh, oh yes, yes. Los yeah. novios, and uh, yeah, we do como salir in the second part. That's great for working with uh, el pasado, imperfecto, mm -hmm. pretérito. Um, and yeah, they're both they're both similar stories, but they're cool stories about you know about uh, sorry plot spoiling anybody's listen. You know, cheating boyfriends and yeah, you know, shady shady uh, teenage dealings, and you know, but yeah. but they really enjoy that. Uh, so I wondered. Um, I don't know if you do you have an excerpt? Maybe maybe you can read some of the jokes from your book or from La Llorona or anything you'd like to read um, kind of putting you on the spot but yeah let's see i don't have a copy of lawyer on over here in this room i'd love to hear some bromas i don't know if you have any of the that, jokes off the top of your head even um yeah okay here's one off the top of my, off the top of my head i'm sorry to put you on the spot but there, no that's that's, that's great him. and i got him <laughs> uh you want me to do it in spanish well well your audience put, understand or? primero espanol y vamos a traducir después okay sí. el chiste entero Sí, por favor. Okay, all right. Había un capitán okay. en un barco. El barco está en el océano. ¿Sí? Sí. Y un día, un marinero okay. le dice, Señor, hay dos barcos piratas que vienen. Y el capitán dice, mm, bien. Tráigame mi camisa roja. Y dice, okay. ¿por qué? Y dice, por si acaso estoy herido. La, los otros marineros en el, en, el, en el barco no van a ver mi, mi sangre y van a, van a estar muy bravos todavía. Like, ok, ok, bien. Entonces el, el capitán se pone la camisa roja. Y ganan contra las dos barcos de piratas. Bueno, well, el próximo día. Un marinero dice, señor, hay diez barcos de piratas. Uh -oh. Y el capitán dice, bien, tráigame mis pantalones cafés. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to laugh out loud. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's really good right so the so the guys so they see the pirate ships is only two the first day he gets he gets he gets wounded right so he says bring me the red shirt so that it kind of covers it up and my yeah. my men will stay strong yeah. second day we got 10 pirates he says bring me my brown pants yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. oh, the kids man. the kids get there right away yeah. that's pretty good yeah. oh man I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. I'll give you a, I'll give you a copyright trademark. You know. Oh, that's good. That's in my book, <laughs> Jokes for Spanish Class. And we just published another one by a wonderful author from Ecuador. And her name is uh, I think she's Ecuador actually, uh, Veronica Moscoso. Moscoso. And uh, okay. She it's a book called Chistes para aprender español. Mm. And it's very similar, to, except mm. you know she's got a lot of illustrations and she has uh, uh -huh. she has. Um, questions after each joke if you want to okay. discuss it as a class or teach yeah. it as a story so that was yeah. just published yesterday I think, so. oh man how cool is that i um yeah do you do you have do you know the pepito jokes the one the pepito jokes i some of them not not real yeah. clear on those but i i'm trying to find one that's clean i think it seemed like they're mostly mostly not appropriate for for school yeah right yeah. <laughs> okay oh that's so cool i wonder what um, what are you working on? I mean, I know that, I mean, you're constantly coming up with, with new things and, and really giving a voice to, you know, like you talk about uh, Mos Senora Moscoso, Moscoso yeah. and yeah. You know, giving a great avenue for others who do great work too. What are, what are you working on? Who, who else are you, you know, working with? That's, uh, thanks for asking that. Um, we're always adding new authors. Mm -hmm. um, we've started to add more and more French books. Oh, okay. Um, we added uh, four French books by Teresa Marama, um, who's a Spanish and French teacher from upstate New York. Um, mm. And we added four of her French books. We have poetry books by translated by Diego Ojeda from Spanish into French. Okay. Um, we're uh, 
And we're, we're at all the time. We have 17 different authors whose books we sell on our website nice, nice. and 86 novels by them, plus my own. So it's over 120 total books Whoa. on our website. But, um, but um, I did uh, wrote this book, High Impact Reading Strategies, my most recent one. I marked it up because I thought you might ask about some stuff in that. Mm. And, um, and but I'm working on now is uh, a, um, a book about uh, special person student interviews. Oh, cool. And just a lot of the, the things we've highlighted here, uh -huh. just why it works, how to do it. Lots and lots and lots of examples of it. So oh, man. that should yeah. be done, I don't know, two, three months. Cool. Yeah, I mean, any, any teachers who are listening, like you want to take three and four and seven and 10 things that Bryce has said and, and, t and take them with you to the classroom. If you're only going to do one, Persona Special is a great place to start. For sure. I agree, because it's right? an interpersonal, interpersonal yeah. speaking yeah. that kids want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why are you taking Spanish? Right. You know? Some will say because I have to, and some will sure. say for a college prerequisite, but mm -hmm. most of them will say because I want to learn to speak Spanish. Yeah. I mean, on some level, they want to learn to speak Spanish, so they wouldn't be in your class every day. Right. You know? And so right. let's let them do that. You know, it's like we need to do that. Well, before I did Persona Especial, if I asked my kids that were in Spanish four, mm -hmm. if you were in the middle of Argentina and you had, there was no one that spoke English around you. And you had to sit by somebody on a train for like an hour or two. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to them in Spanish? And they would just, my Spanish four students, before I taught this way, would just like, ah! they get just panicked look on their face. But now you ask kids in Spanish one, you say, could you do that? And they're like, yes. What, you think I'm mm -hmm. stupid, senor? Mm -hmm. You know, you think I'm an idiot? You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's their frame of reference. Like who couldn't talk to someone yes. for an hour in Spanish? Yes. The you exception, know? not the, the exception, not the rule now. Instead of exactly. The yeah. I'd love to hear some feedback of uh, like students who you've taught over the years who are Spanish teachers themselves, or they live in, you know, they live abroad and speak, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you've gotten thousands of messages and, and all I that. have lots of good, I have yeah. good stories. Yeah. One of my best is um, I have a student who is a assistant professor of Spanish literature at the University of North Carolina. Wow. No slouch school. You no, know? no, no, no. It's, it's like, and he, he says, you, his name is David, Professor David Dalton, Dr. Dalton. Ah, he said, uh, he said, you let me borrow a, uh, let's see, please scary books. Uh, what, it, what was it? Was, I forget what it was, but it, he said, you let me borrow this book when I was in a Goosebumps book in oh, Spanish. Oh, yeah, I was going to say R.L. Stein. Let me yeah. borrow a Goosebumps book when I was in Spanish too. And he said, I loved reading it. I especially enjoyed reading it in math class. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, and then I got a PhD in Spanish literature. Whoa. You know, so <laughs> a few steps in between there. But yeah. uh, he, he says he remembers like the joy just being able to read in Spanish. Mm. I have uh, other, another uh, student that's teaching uh, at a college in California. I have lots of uh, former students that are Spanish teachers. Just mm -hmm. got, just right before this interview, I got one that uh, she said, you know, I'm so glad I was in your class. And I just got a review from my principal who said, how in the world did you learn to become such a good teacher? Oh. And because she was, you know, she just experienced it. She lived it. Mm -hmm. And so that's extremely gratifying. I have, I have students um, that have married um, Spanish speaking um, partners and, uh, you know, one that uh, he lives in Nicaragua, married a Nicaraguan woman and uh, raising his kids there and, and building like Habitat for Humanity type houses there, you know, because he could be so fluent. Had another kid that was uh, an engineer and could not get an engineering job until they they saw until he start added that he's fluent in spanish because he, he called me said can i say i'm fluent in spanish i'm like is there anything you couldn't talk about in spanish you know right now i mean you know i so said maybe some technical stuff you'd have to read up on it but could you because he took ap spanish mm. and he goes yeah he goes, i'm sam fluent and he got the job because he was fluent in spanish wow. they took him down to mexico and and took him to this dam that needed some work work on the hydro or electric project yeah. and he was able to talk with people about it and 
um, you know, communicate in, in just all over the place and uh, got its job because of that. So, so cool. It's, you know, I mean, I've been around a while though. So, <laughs> and, and people I'm easy to get a hold of. So, I'm sure that everybody eventually has stories like that. So, oh man. Well, um, I'll, I'll love to end with, uh, you know, giving out your contact info, where we can find the resources, website, social media, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, my website, luckily enough, is bryceheadstrom.com. There it is. So, and um, on Facebook, I'm Bryce Hedstrom or bryceheadstrom.com. Mm -hmm. You know, on Instagram, I'm uh, at Bryce Hedstrom or hashtag Bryce Hedstrom. <laughs> so you can find just remember my name. That's it. So, well, um, I am completely, totally invigorated. Looking forward to really, you know, coming back to some of the things that I learned and like, hey, this, you know, the little tweaks that I'll that I'll make after talking to you. Um, getting that that poster up there for Persona Special. I usually have them do it with like a on the on the screen. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be more like you know, sight word on the word word wall type of thing. Um, getting the rejoinders in there in a different way. Um, the call and response for sure. I love, love, love um, Los Dichos, Los, Los Dichos. Um, and I want to get those involved maybe as my code, my password. So I'm just totally invigorated. I really just appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been, this has been a blast talking with you, especially uh, since you understand so much. Yes. <laughs> I didn't think it was actually going to go this way. I thought it was oh, only man. What no. books have you been reading or something? You know, but, right. Uh, yeah. No, this is not going to be not going to be the last time we talk. Um, I hope not. Right? Yeah. No. And as, uh, as you uh, as you work your way through some of these, I'd love to hear some feedback from yes. you. Too. Yes. Yes. So. We're for sure going to be in touch, and and I really just appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I wish you continued great luck with with all of your curriculum writing and everything you're doing. Thanks again so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pete. I really appreciate it. Thank All you right. to Bryce. Muchas gracias. Thank you for listening to episode 109 yeah. with Bryce Hedstrom. You can now <laughs> subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and please leave a five-star review. You can also ask for it by name using Alexa and find it on Stitcher, Spotify. And if you want to give money to that Jeff Bezos guy, but not really Amazon Music. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will Podcast or on Twitter where I'm at Chills at Will PO1. You can watch this and other episodes on YouTube. Watch and subscribe to the Chills at Will podcast channel. Please subscribe to both YouTube channel and podcast while you're checking out this episode. This is a passion project of mine, a DIY operation, and I love free help in promoting what I'm convinced is a unique and spirited look in an often ignored art form. The intro song for the Chills at Will podcast is Wind Down Instrumental, and the other song played on the episode was Hoops Instrumental by Matt, by Matt Whitehour. And both songs are used through archesaudio.com. Please tune in for episode 110 with Tyler Bias, Taylor Bias, excuse me, a PhD student and Yates scholar at the University of Cincinnati and an assistant features editor for The Rumpus. She was the first place winner of both the Poetry Superhighway and the Frontier Poetry Award for New Poet Contests. And her latest standout work is Blood Warm. That episode will air on March 29th. For now, thanks again for listening, and I hope that these quarantine days bring you texts by writers with mad skills, como Senor Bryce Hedstrom, whose curriculum work and writing give you chills at will.